Hello and welcome to Scripture Verse by Verse. My name is Michael Moret. We're in Acts today. We pick up our study in Acts chapter 22, verse 17. Get your Bible if you can and continue with me verse by verse through the book of Acts as we go through the entire New Testament, this series. If you want to study the whole Bible with me, you can do that at the Scripture Verse by Verse website, which is found at thebibleversebyverse.com. Click and listen to any book of the Bible that you want to study using my audio Bible messages. All you need to bring is your Bible. That's at thebibleversebyverse.com. Okay, well, Acts chapter 22, beginning in verse 17. Let's pray. Lord, we ask that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. And it came to pass that when I was come again to Jerusalem, even while I prayed in the temple, I was in a trance and saw him saying unto me, Make haste and get thee quickly out of Jerusalem for they will not receive thy testimony concerning me. And so Jesus appeared to Saul again and told him to leave Jerusalem. Remember, Paul is, is telling his story of his conversion and his early walk with the Lord. And he came to Jerusalem and Jesus appeared, so you better get out of there because people are not going to believe that you are truly a Christian Christians are not going to believe that you're truly a Christian, nor would the Jews believe his message about Christ because they weren't interested in it. So he was in a tough spot. And the fact that Saul had been a great Jewish zealot and highly educated from Tarsus wouldn't carry any, carry any weight with the Jews who rejected the Holy Scriptures and Jesus Christ. And that's why Jesus said, you better get out of Jerusalem. 19, and I said, Lord, they know that I imprisoned and beat in every synagogue those that believed on thee. In other words, Lord, I think you've got it wrong. I think the Jews are impressed by my extreme turnaround. He's kind of arguing a little bit with Jesus here. 20. And when the blood of thy martyr Stephen was shed, I also was standing by and consenting unto his death and kept the raiment of them that slew him. So he's saying, I think the Jews will believe my conversion was real and I think they will also believe that Jesus is real after all I used to kill Christians because of their faith and now look at me I don't do that anymore that's got to have an impact on them don't you think well you know a miraculous turnaround by Saul will definitely strengthen the faith of Christians but it will not impress the unsaved if the unsaved are not willing to accept the testimony of Scripture concerning Jesus Christ. 21. And he said unto me, Depart, for I will send thee far from here unto the Gentiles. So Jesus let Paul give his opinion, and then he basically went back to square one and said, Well, you know, like I said in the beginning, leave. And we learn from this that Paul did not decide where he was going to minister. Perhaps he felt that he could be effective among the Jews that, had, that he had so much in common with. But no matter what he felt, he was going to the Gentiles. He was going to the heathen. He's got his marching orders directly from Jesus. 22. And they listened to him. This crowd that Paul is rehearsing this story to, they listened to him until this word, and then 
lifted up their voices and said, Away with such a fellow from the earth, for it is not fit that he should live. Wow. The Jews, who Paul was speaking to, listened patiently until he said that Jesus Christ sent him to the Gentiles, and then they screamed for his death. Those miserable, arrogant, self-righteous Hebrews were appalled at the very thought that God might offer salvation to the heathen. What they didn't understand is that they were just as sinful, only in a different way. People should not bother thinking that they are better than others. That's a waste of time and it's a lie because we're all depraved sinners in the eyes of God and our only hope is Jesus. 23. And as they cried out and cast off their clothes and threw dust into the air, boy, they really went berserk. They are really putting on a show of disgust over Paul's declaration that God wants Gentiles to be saved. And I, if there was dust in heaven, I think Almighty God would throw it into the air after witnessing their self-righteous attitude. 24. The chief captain commanded him to be brought into the barracks and bade that he should be examined by scourging that he might know for what reason they cried so against him. Remember, this captain did not understand anything that Saul was telling these Jews because he spoke in Hebrew. And all he saw was the reaction of the crowd that just went crazy. He didn't know anything about Paul. And so the Roman commander decided he was going to get to the bottom of this issue and he was going to try to beat the truth out of Saul rip his back to shreds and maybe he'll speak the truth, which assumes that he was telling a lie, which he wasn't, so beating isn't going to change anything. 25. And as they bound him with thongs, Paul said unto the centurion that stood by, Is it lawful for you to scourge a man that is a Roman and uncondemned? And so Paul wisely plays his Roman citizenship card right here. He's actually doing that Roman commander a huge favor by declaring that he is a Roman citizen before he orders Paul to be whipped. Because anyone who whipped a Roman citizen before they were given due process of the law could be executed. 26. When the centurion heard that, he went and told the chief captain, saying, Take heed what thou doest, for this man is a Roman. In other words, you whip that man, and you're sentencing both of us to death. 27. Then the chief captain came and said unto him, Tell me, art thou a Roman? He said, Yea. Commander should have asked this question earlier. 28. And the chief captain answered, with a great sum obtained I this freedom. And Paul said, but I was free born. Paul was one up on this commander because he was born a Roman citizen, 29. Then immediately they departed from him who should have examined him. And the chief captain also was afraid after he knew that he was a Roman and because he had bound him. The commander knows that he just dodged a deadly bullet. Thanks to Paul's honesty, he came ever so close to ordering the beating of a Roman citizen who had not been tried in a court and found guilty. And actually, the commander is still sweating because although he had not beaten Paul, he had him bound, and that was wrong also. 30. On the next day, because he would have known the certainty for what reason he was accused by the Jews, he loosed him and his bands 
and commanded the chief priest and all their council to appear, and brought Paul down and set him before them. That commander still wants to get to the bottom of this strife between the Jews and Paul, so he calls them together, and he will listen to both sides of the story. And that's the way to do it. The Bible says that one man's explanation seems to make sense until his opponent gives his side of the story. <clears throat> Always listen to both sides of the story before taking sides. That's the biblical thing to do. Chapter 23. And Paul, earnestly beholding the council, said, Men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. And I really believe Paul did live with a good conscience, even when he was doing wrong. Because, for example, when he was persecuting the church, he did it with a clear conscience because he thought it was the correct thing to do. He thought he was serving the Lord. Our conscience is great, but it has to be sharpened by the written word of God so that we feel guilt when we should and feel peace when we should. 22. And the high priest, Ananias, commanded them that stood by him to smite him on the mouth. High priests didn't like it when Paul said that he had a clear conscience because he didn't believe that Paul should have that clear conscience. Paul's conscience isn't the business of the high priest. Paul's conscience is between him and God, but the high priest didn't like it, so he had Paul slapped. 3. Then said Paul unto him, God shall smite thee, thou whited wall. For saidest thou to judge me after the law, and commandest me to be smitten contrary to the law? And Paul's absolutely right. The conscience of the high priest ought to be bothering him because he broke God's law when he ordered Paul to be slapped before he was even found guilty of anything. The high priest presumes to know that Paul's conscience should be bothering him. Meanwhile, he overlooks the fact that his own conscience should be bothering him. Beware of those who would judge your soul when they are not able or willing to first judge their own Verse 4, And they that stood by said, Revilest thou God's high priest? And I suppose it was wrong for Paul to call the high priest a whitewashed wall. It was wrong for him to call the high priest a name. <clears throat> but again, he did it in ignorance, as we will see. Verse 5, then said Paul, I knew not, brethren, that he was the high priest. For it is written, Thou shalt not speak evil of the ruler of thy people. Paul governed his life by the word of God as he knew it. His conscience was clear, even after calling the high priest a whitewashed wall, because he didn't know that he was the high priest. So Paul lived up to the light that he had. But he grew in knowledge of the truth because he was always in the word of God. Live up to the light that you have, but keep reading the Bible so that that light of yours increases. Verse 6. But when Saul perceived that the one part were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, he cried out in the council, Men and brethren, I am a Pharisee the son of a Pharisee, of the hope and resurrection of the dead, I am called in question. See, this was a great move by Paul. The apostle knew that his audience was split between two religious sects, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. So he did the smart thing by announcing that he was a Pharisee and that he believed in the resurrection of the dead. He's attempting to divide and conquer his opponents because he knows the Pharisees will be sympathetic to the fact that he believes in the resurrection of the dead, which the Sadducees do not believe in. 7. And when he had so said, there arose a dissension between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the multitude was divided, so he accomplished his goal. 
Like Jesus said, a house divided against itself cannot stand. And Paul has successfully divided his accusers. Now they're fighting each other. Verse 8, For the Sadducees, Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, neither angel nor spirit, but the Pharisees confess both. Up until, brought, up until Paul brought up the doctrine of the resurrection, these two religious sects were united in their opposition of the apostle. But once theology became an issue, they quickly divided. The Pharisees' beliefs were correct, and the Sadducees' beliefs were incorrect, and the only way they could get along was to ignore doctrine. As long as they were ignoring doctrine, they were getting along just fine. And you know, the big problem with the Christian ecumenical movement of today is that they ignore biblical truth in order to get along. Never ignore what the Bible teaches in order to get along with anyone. That's too high a price to pay for peace. Peace at any price is not a biblical doctrine. Verse 9. And there arose a great cry, and the scribes, who were of the Pharisees' party, arose and contended sharply, saying, We find no evil in this man. But if a spirit or an angel have spoken to him, let us not fight against God. See, the Pharisees seem to like Paul, at least a little bit right now, now that he has mentioned that he's one of them and that he believes in the resurrection. And in their defense of Paul, they take a shot at the Sadducees, saying, perhaps Paul got his information from an angel or a spirit, which would offend them because they didn't believe in either one of those. 10. And when there arose a great dissension, the chief captain, fearing lest Paul should have been pulled in pieces by them, commanded the soldiers to go down and to take him by force from among them and to bring him into the barracks. The Roman commander could see a tug of war brewing between the Sadducees and the Pharisees with Paul being the rope. So he got Paul out of there, verse 11. And the night following, the Lord stood by him and said, Be of good cheer, Paul, for as thou hast testified of me in Jerusalem, so must thou bear witness also at Rome. Some Christians today, especially those who teach a pre-tribulation rapture of the church, say that the Bible teaches the imminent return of Jesus Christ. Have you ever been taught that? That Jesus Christ could return at any time? That's not true. You cannot prove that by the Bible. You might be able to prove that by speculation and conjecture and twisting the scripture, but you can't prove that from a straightforward look at scripture. The Bible does not teach the imminent, imminent return of Christ. Paul certainly didn't believe in that doctrine. He knew that Jesus couldn't return any second. Jesus told him that he would preach Christ in Rome after surviving his stay in Jerusalem. Paul knew that Christ wasn't going to return at any moment because it would take a long time for him to travel to Rome and preach Jesus there. And none of the apostles believed in the imminent return of Christ because they were told by Jesus to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And that's not going to be done overnight. See how things are said and accept it as being true without really investigating what the scriptures teach? You see how dangerous that is? False doctrines are always dangerous, even ones that are accepted by many, many so-called Bible-believing Christians. Verse 12, And when it was day, certain of the Jews banded together and bound themselves under a curse, saying that they would neither eat nor drink till they had killed Paul. The Jews hated Paul the Christian as much as, as he hated the Christians before he became one of them. And the Jews had determined to kill Paul or die trying. 13. And they were, and, and they were more than 40 
who had made this conspiracy. And they came to the chief priests and elders and said, We have bound ourselves under a great curse that we will eat nothing until we have slain Paul. Now therefore ye with the council signified to the chief captain that he bring him down unto you tomorrow as though ye would inquire something more perfectly concerning him and we before he comes near are ready to kill him notice how twisted their ungodly minds were they justified lying to trap Saul or Paul they justified murder in their self-righteous attempt to punish one that they wrongly accused of being a blasphemer. They justified lying. They justified murder. Their arrogance allows them to break the law of God in a twisted, biased attempt to defend the law of God. God says, shall we do evil that good may come? And he follows that up by saying, God forbid. 16. And when Paul's sister's son heard of their lying in wait, he went and entered into the barracks and told Paul. Then Paul called one of the centurions unto him and said, Bring this young man unto the chief captain, for he hath a certain thing to tell him. So he took him and brought him to the chief captain and said, Paul the prisoner, called me unto him, and asked me to bring this young man unto thee, who hath something to say unto thee. Then the chief captain took him by the hand, and went with him in aside privately, and asked him, What is it that thou hast to tell me? And he said, The Jews have agreed to desire thee, that thou wouldest bring down Paul to tomorrow into the council, as though they would inquire somewhat of him, more perfectly but do not thou yield unto them for there lie in wait for him of them more than 40 men who have bound themselves with an oath that they will neither eat nor drink till they have killed him and now are they ready looking for a promise from thee God in his providence made sure the right people discovered this ungodly plot so that Paul could be warned. God sometimes delivers his people through miracles, but more often he does it through his providence, whereby he arranges circumstances in a manner where his people are protected. 22. So the chief captain then let the young man depart, and charged him, See, thou tell no man that thou hast shown these things to me. Sometimes God's plan for his people calls for covert activity. In other words, don't talk too much. Measure your words carefully. Think before you speak, because words spoken in the hearing of the wrong people can interrupt God's plan. Verse 23. And he called unto him, two centurions, saying, Make ready two hundred soldiers to go to Caesarea, and seventy horsemen and two hundred spearmen at the third hour of the night, and provide beasts that they may set Paul on and bring him safely unto Felix the governor. The Romans, think of this, the Romans will have 470 well-armed soldiers with Paul protecting him from those 40 Jews who swore not to eat until they ambushed and killed him. I guess they're going to be hungry for a while. 25. And he wrote a letter after this manner. The commander writes a letter to the governor to be sent along with Paul the prisoner. 26. Claudius Lysias unto the most excellent governor Felix. Greeting. And here we learn that the commander's name was Claudius Lysias. 27. This man, speaking of Paul, was taken by the Jews and would have been killed by them. Then came I 
with an army and rescued him, having understood that he was a Roman. Now, this commander, I commend him for protecting Paul. But he isn't being 100% truthful here either. He says, I saved Paul from the Jews because I knew he was a Roman. He did not know Paul was a Roman. That's not why he saved him. He saved him in order to avoid a riot. Taking credit for something we did not do may be stealing, and it certainly is deception. 28. And when I would have known the cause for which they accused him, I brought him forth into their council. And notice that the commander didn't mention how he nearly whipped Paul, the Roman, or that he had him in chains. Like sinners often do, he left out the parts where he was wrong so that it seemed like he did everything right. Verse 29, whom I perceived to be accused of questions of their law, but to have nothing laid to his charge worthy of death or bonds. He says the Jews hated Paul and it had something to do with their religion. He knew they hated Paul because he taught the resurrection, but he doesn't mention that. Often people, even successful people, who you would think should know better, ignore great eternal doctrines as if they were not even worth mentioning. Verse 30. And when it was told me how the Jews laid wait for the man, I sent immediately to thee and gave commandment to his accusers also to say before thee what they had against him. Farewell. So, when he learned of the planned ambush, he sent Paul and his Jewish accusers to the governor. 31. Then the soldiers, as it was commanded them, took Paul and brought him by night to Antipatris. They traveled 42 miles at night to reach their first stop on the way to the governor. 32. On the next day, they left the horsemen to go with him and returned to the barracks. So 400 of the 470 soldiers turned around and went back to Jerusalem, leaving the remaining 72 to escort Paul on the last part of his trip to Caesarea and the governor. 33. Who, when they came to Caesarea and delivered the, apostle, or the epistle to the governor, presented Paul also before him. And when the governor had read the letter, he asked of what province he was. And when he understood that he was of Cilicia, I will hear thee, said he, when thine accusers are also come. And he commanded him to be kept in Herod's judgment hall. Jesus told his apostles that they would speak to rulers on his behalf. And that's what Paul has been doing here now and what he will continue to do. Now, it probably didn't happen the way Paul thought it would. You know, being brought before rulers, probably, you know, accepted in a nice way, probably was in the back of his mind and the mind of the other apostles when Jesus said, you're going to be brought before rulers and you're going to testify concerning me. That's, you know, probably what they thought, I would, I would think. That's going to be great. I'm, I'm going to be popular with the rulers. They're going, to, they're going to listen to what I say. It's going to be smooth sailing, perhaps. But that's not, that's not what's, what's happening. That's not how he's being brought before the rulers. And that goes for the other apostles, too. They were, more often than not, brought before rulers as prisoners. And often we believe God will do something, and he does, but he doesn't do it the way we imagine that he would. That's what living by faith is all about. Out of time, continue studying with me at thebibleversebyverse.com. Click and listen. That's all you have to do. Bring your Bible to thebibleversebyverse.com and study at your pace and at your convenience. If you want to be a part of this ministry, please remember I'm not underwritten by a large church or denomination. You can pray for me and pray for the word, and I would appreciate that very much. And also click the donate button at the top of the front page at thebibleversebyverse.com and prayerfully give as the Lord may lead. Until next time, so long, everyone.